smoking lamp of Well, well no. we're on Mars. The first we're man is shipped to Earth with a lamp. We don't know what we're going to find or what dangers we may face. We're 17 men on an alien world. It's up to us whether we ever get home again. Next few hours, we'll tell the story. Welcome to Night School. I'm one of your hosts, Aria. And I'm Darian. Is it is it just me or is it getting hot in here? No, not just you, Aria. What is going on? I, you know, I have a feeling that it's because every month we bring together scientists, artists, and creators around a new theme. And tonight it is all about heat. So that might explain some of this. Um, heat about uh, heat from here on Earth all the way out to space. Yada 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 boom boom kaka. It's night school, heated. <laughs> we are so excited to introduce you to tonight's guests. But to, but first, uh, Darian, what is this thing that is about to show up on our screen? Oh, a QR code. That one. That, that one, one, Aria. Just like last month, it is the QR code that links to the survey that will help us to learn more about some of our favorite people on Earth. You all are night school viewers, so that we can continue to create this program with you all in mind. Amazing. Um, we have shared this on the past couple episodes, like Darian mentioned, and we will share it again. Um, we would love to hear from you so we can continue making night school the best it can be with your interests in mind. All the responses will be kept totally confidential. Um, and you can check it out through that QR code on screen or this link that we're about to put into the chat. But now, Darian, who do we get to hear from tonight? Well, first we will hear from the Academy's very own geology collections manager, Crystal Cortez, who will tell us how the largest, te the largest tectonic plate in the world, the Pacific plate, truly does it all, from creating mountains to earthquakes to tonight's main focus, volcanoes. Only a little unnerving knowing that this is the plate below my feet right here in San Francisco. <laughs> Crystal will share all about how the Earth's many tectonic plates interact with one another to create the environments we know today, and about a key factor that makes the Pacific plate particularly special. The Ring of Fire. Ooh, don't fall in, anybody. Next, Ryan Wyatt, the Academy's Senior Director of the Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization, will fly us across our solar system to walk us through how we define and detect heat in the frigid vacuum of space, even from light years away. Pretty mind-boggling stuff. We'll explore heat within and outside of our own solar system, like volcanology on Mars, the scalding surface of Mercury, and molecular fusion inside of stars like our own sun. And if you stick around, you may catch a little sneak peek at Spark, the Universe and Us, the Academy's all new original planetarium show, which just launched six days ago. You should go see it if you're in San Francisco. As a great poet once said, that's hot. 
As always, tonight's program is live. So whether you're with us on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch, say hi. Let us know where in the world you're watching from. And let us know your questions for Crystal and Ryan in the chat or the comments, because we will have a Q&A session after each of their segments. And with that, we will turn it over to Crystal Cortez. Okay, hello everyone. That was such a wonderful introduction. I just wanna say um, that is a great poet and it really is hot. So let's stick with the theme and let's continue with the heat. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about volcanoes. Like my introduction said, I'm Crystal Cortez. I'm from the California Academy of Sciences and I am the geology collections manager. Let's get started. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Pacific Ring of Fire, which I'm sure that some of you may or may not have heard of, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. And I'm going to talk to you about tectonic plates because you cannot talk about the Ring of Fire. You cannot talk about volcanoes without talking about uh, tectonic plates, the different types of plate, plate, ba plate boundaries, and also the different types of volcanoes. Did you know that there was different types of volcanoes? that create different types of rocks. Um, some of you probably didn't. So let's figure out what they are. So first of all, the ring of fire. If you look at this photo, you can kind of make out if you kind of squint your eye and you look at it through a very weird lens, you can kind of see that it, this is a, a ring. Um, this is a, a superimposed ring of fire. And this is a ring because it's technically a belt of intense volcanic activity and frequent earthquakes. We are in San Francisco, so we know earthquakes very well. Even in Calif all of California, we know earthquakes very well. And California lies right about there. So you can see why we get a lot of uh, earthquakes and it's all due to this ring of fire. What is the Ring of Fire? Well, it's home to approximately 75% of the Earth's active volcanoes. Now, I'm just going to pause for a second because think about that. 75% of the world's active volcanoes. That is a lot of volcanism happening in a relatively small spot. Um, since we're going to be talking about space a little bit later and you guys are going to be able to hear about it, this is not a very big area. So this is gonna be a very, very hot area. And why is it cause? Tectonic plates, always, all the time. Tectonics, plate tectonics is, if something is wrong with the earth, it's plate tectonics, chances are. So what are plate tectonics? These are all the different plates that we have on earth. You can see that there's different types of plate boundaries. So all of these colors are actually telling you the different types of plate boundaries that you're seeing. And I know that this is a little bit skewed from the last image. I couldn't find one that actually fit exactly where the Pacific is. But you can see this big, giant, massive Pacific plate. It kind of goes over on this other side in the Philippines. Um, but you're seeing that blue. And those blues are active subduction zones. So that means that the plate is going under another one. What do I mean by that? I'm going to show you in a little bit. Okay, so now this, I love this image. Uh, I'm a geek for really good imagery. And this is just a really great image that kind of shows you a little bit more about the plate boundaries. What I'm trying to show here is a convergent plate boundary. And this is specifically an oceanic oceanic. So these are two oceanic plates that are coming together and they're very hard, very dense, very, very heavy plates. And so when they come together, they're going to start smashing into each other and start subducting under each other. And that is called a convergent plate boundary. Usually when you have this oceanic oceanic plate boundary, you're going to end up with something called a shield volcano. Keep that in mind because I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. Another type of convergent plate boundary is oceanic continental. You see that there's an oceanic plate and there's a continental plate. A continental plate is actually going to be a lot more buoyant than the oceanic plate. An oceanic plate is very, very dense. Like I said, it's very heavy, so it's going to want to subduct 
underneath a continental plate. You're never going to see a uh, an oceanic plate go over a continental plate. You do have island accretions where you'll have oceanic plate accrete onto a continental plate, but you're never going to have a continent uh, oceanic plate go on top of a continental plate. And that's because a continental plate is very, very buoyant. It doesn't want to sink down. And that buoyancy adds to the silica. So now we're going to get into volcanoes that are going to be a little bit more active. And that's going to be your stratovolcano or your composite cone volcano. Both are technically correct terms, but that's what you're seeing in this area here. There's other types of boundaries. So another type of boundary is a divergent boundary. And a divergent boundary is basically a spreading center. You have two different types of spreading centers. You have one on the sea floor. This is going to be your MORs, your mid-oceanic ridges. Um, I don't know if you've ever Googled it. If you haven't, you should try to Google it. But try to Google uh, just a photo of the sea floor and you'll see all these mountains and hills and volcanoes and and all these these different ridges that are happening and that's all part of the sea floor spreading and it's basically the sea floor is spreading there's they're spreading apart on the continent we call that a rift valley and you'll see rift valleys in uh there's a famous one down in africa where you're actually seeing the continent split apart um, and then you also see those in uh, Iceland and, and Greenland where you see those those fusion bubbling out of the ground, not really explosive, just there's lava. Um, another type that's a little, we're not going to really get into this part because it doesn't really take place in the ring of fire. And these are hot spots. Hot spots are basically just areas in the mantle where you have these mantle plumes that are just going to bubble up and they're just going to be able and they just kind of pop out and then you're going to have these like little volcanoes and those are going to be different types of volcanoes you'll see that i kind of gave a uh, kind of a, a little bit of a sneak peek as to what type of volcanoes these boundaries actually create but with hot spots you're just going to have a different type of volcano because it's going to be dependent on the location and i'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit this is by far my favorite slide. So I've been talking to you about all these different types of plate boundaries. You have convergent boundaries, you have divergent boundaries, and you also have this one called the transverse um, boundary. And that's kind of what we have here in California. In California, obviously, we don't have very many volcanoes. I mean, we have Lassen and Shasta, but um, we don't have a whole lot of volcanism going on. And that is because our plate boundary is not a convergent or a divergent boundary. We have a transverse uh, boundary where we have that uh, transform fault that's just kind of uh, sliding up against each other. And when two plates are sliding against each other, you're well, you're going to have a lot of friction and you're going to have a lot of earthquakes. Obviously, if we live in California. We know that we have a lot of earthquakes here. Um, you, so you're going to have a lot of earthquake here, but you're not going to have enough heat being produced to actually create these big volcanoes. What you can see here, so this is a map of depths. So when you see that dark purple color or the, the almost black color, that's how deep that is. So basically what you're seeing here, so like this is this is Chile here. Um, and, in, and if you think about where Chile is, you have Patagonia, you have all these big mountain ranges and all those big mountain ranges are created by this, plate subducting underneath this other plate and you can really see this plate outlined um, by the by this imagery here and you can actually see up by like the pacific northwest you have some plates going underneath but they're not really that deep you only get into like the orange maybe maybe reddish um color there but um, if you go over here to Indonesia, you can see like right around where the Indonesian islands are, it is it is pretty much black. And that is because that plate is really deep and it's causing some major trouble over there. And um, I know that we all heard about the tsunami that happened and that's all due to the active plate boundary. That's movement of the plates, that's releasing energy. Anytime you're moving something, you're gonna start releasing energy. 
and this is good, what's going to happen. And this is a beautiful image because it really does show you how plates are moving and how plates are subducting under one another. Um, in Africa, here's that Rift Valley that I was talking about um, earlier, where you're seeing that 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 split, and then you see a little bit of volcanism, and you see a little bit of that plate boundary being subducted underneath there. So just kind of like uh, another brief image on this one, you can kind of uh superimpose this image on this onto this image and you can really see where you're you're getting that dark deep purple color up here and over here and and then you're also getting that black right here on this indonesian islands like i was saying okay so types of volcanoes obviously i'm telling you i gave you a little bit of a hint as to what is going on in the different and the different types of, of uh, volcanoes and different types of areas. But let's go dive a little deeper and let's see what all of these volcanoes are actually doing. So first of all, I wanna talk about shield volcanoes. Shield volcanoes are these gentle sloping broad volcanoes. And these guys are what I would describe as a gentle giant. They are low viscosity and for those of you that don't know viscosity is basically how thick a substance is so these guys are very thin if you would if you would if you want to think about it as in syrupy uh substances uh, this would be the store-bought maple syrup <laughs> um where it's going to be very thin it's going to come out and it's just going to be kind of like a a bleh, you know, um, and that is because it's fairly low in silica. So it's usually about 45 to 50% silica. And that silica is really going to be the determining factor as to how explosive something is going to be. So it's going to increase in vis the more viscous it is, the, um, the more silica you're going to have. And this is going to give you basalt. So this is going to be your mafic uh, rocks. This is going to be those typical rocks that you see in your garden, in your, you know, uh, I know we usually have them in like a fire pit and, and people usually use this like really pretty, it's like porous and dark and really, really dark or like really black. Um, the eruption style is just going to be a slow stream. This, um, I give the example of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, although Hawaii is a hot spot, not technically part of the Ring of Fire, but uh, but yeah, so you're gonna see this um, this type of ropey te texture. It's called the Pahoehoe lava flow, and it's basically just this ropey texture because it's flowing out so smoothly. If you ever seen videos of people going up to lava and like picking at it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess I just watch more videos of people playing with lava than a normal person should. But if you haven't seen it, you should definitely look at it because it looks really dangerous. But it's actually not because you're having this very, very, very calm flow, stream-like flow um, and off of a, of a shield volcano. Next, it's going to be a stratovolcano or a composite cone. It just depends on on what you want to call it. And this is going to be a more silica rich. So we're going to have we're we're upping our silica to about fifty to sixty five percent. Our viscosity is going to be higher. So if we're again, if we're thinking about syrupy substances, if uh, the shield volcano was a store bought, you know, syrup. Um, I would attribute this to being more like honey, where it's a little bit thick, but it's not, it could be thicker, right? Um, it's usually going to happen online, on land, because it needs that silica. Silica is going to come from your continental crust, and it's not really going to come out of the oceanic crust. If you think about the oceanic crust, an oceanic crust is very dark, it's very thick, it's very dense, and there's not a whole lot of light colors inside of it. So... That's why usually when you see a composite cone or a stratovolcano, you're, that's going to be mostly on land because you're going to have to pick up some of that silica to make it a little bit more um, viscous. An example of this is Mount St. Helens, which uh, many of you know, many of you were alive possibly um, during the last uh, volcanic eruption, which was in the 1980s. And that was about one cubic a kilometer worth of volcanic ash and by volcanic ash I'm kind of meaning 
all of the stuff that comes out of a volcano. So volcanic ash, lahars, and, and all that different type of debris that comes out from a volcano. So an eruption style, it can be explosive. It's not always like ridiculously explosive, but it, it could be pretty explosive. As you can see here, Mount St. Helens is still very much there. Um, there's a big, there's a big hole in it that of, of where it's Loaded, and that's because it kind of act a plug. Again, you're talking about viscosity. This is something that was a little bit thick. Kind of think about it whenever, I don't know if you've ever gotten honey and there's like a little honey plug at the top and you're just trying to get the honey out and you just kind of squeeze it a little bit and then it pops out. And then so it just makes a little pop and then it's it's done. Um, and so that's kind of what you think about if a uh, composite stratovolcano. And these are very common along the ring of fire. This is something that's not around the Ring of Fire, but I knew I had to add it because somebody would ask. And this is a caldera or a super volcano. A super volcano is described as being very silica rich. Uh, most of that rock is gonna be rhyolite. So this is an example of rhyolite. You can see that that's pink, almost white. What's going on here? Why is it white? Why is it pink? It shouldn't be that color, especially if it's coming out of a volcano. We're used to seeing black, like the basalts, but no, this is actually going to be very much lighter, um, and that is because of the high silica content. It's always on a continental crust because it's going to need to pick up, again, that silica off that continental crust. This is a very, very explosive reaction. <laughs> you don't want to be anywhere near this thing if it blows. Um, an example of this is Mount Masuma, which is... Crater Lake. Many, many of you guys know it as Crater Lake, um, but it was a mountain once. It was called Mount Masuma. Uh, and that exploded about 7,700 uh, years ago, not even million years ago, sorry, um, but 7,700 uh, years ago. And that was about 75 cubic kilometers of, of debris. So if we're thinking about Mount St. Helens and how much debris that had, that had one. <laughs> this one had 75. So obviously that's an exponential growth on how much you're actually getting for this giant volcanic eruption. And this is the caldera that's left. So if you go, if you've ever been to, to Crater Lake, um, which is not too far from us here in San Francisco, it's going to be this big crater. It's created this lake. And it's basically what happens is that there is this big cave in and then it just kind of erupts and it just lets go. It lets go of all of this different energy. And again, it's because of that silica. It's always because of the silica. I don't know if you've noticed that there's a trend here, but there's that silica, that silica plug just creates a plug in the top. And what's going to happen that plug, it's going to explode. And because I knew that somebody was going to ask Yellowstone, right? When we're talking about super volcanoes, if we're going to talk about volcanoes, you have to bring up Yellowstone. Um, and so I did put in a slide of Yellowstone. You have the Yellowstone caldera. The last explosion was about 2 million years ago. And the amount of ash that came out of that was about 2,500 cubic kilometers. And if we think about it, Mount St. Helens was one. Yellowstone, the last time it blew, was 2,500. And if we want to think about what a cubic kilometer of sediment would be like, uh, just imagine it this way. One cubic kilometer um, is about enough sediment and debris and ash and all that stuff. Um, it can fill the Rose Bowl about 1,766 times. And that is an astronomical number. Um, the Rose Bowl, as you know, uh, if you want to Google it, it's it's going to be it is it's a lot. It's a it's a lot, and that's just one cubic kilometer. So if you're thinking about what 2,500 would look like, uh, it's it's not going to be good. If Yellowstone blows, it's not going to be good. Uh, the good thing is all those doomsday theories are mostly wrong. Um, but even if they're not, you're probably not going to survive. There's no way to escape this. I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but um, the good the good news is, though, again, it did explode two million years ago, and it has a record of exploding every couple of millions of years. So we at least got a, about five million years again before it, it explodes. Um, Fun fact, humans have never really seen a super volcano erupt, so we really don't know what the, how that would affect us, but it is what it is. 
So in summary, the Ring of Fire is a volcanic belt around along the Pacific Rim. Volcanism is caused by plate tectonics and also hot spots. A volcano's explosivity, I don't know if that's actually a word, but like depending on how big the explosion is going to be, is very well correlated with the amount of silica present. So silica is going to be the determining factor on how explosive a volcano is actually going to be. Um, super volcanoes usually happen over hot spots under continental crust, because again, you're going to want to have that high silica content. And no, Yellowstone will not be exploding anytime soon. And thank you. And I think I'm ready for questions if there is any. Hey, Crystal, we do indeed have many questions. Um, I, for one, like let a big breath go learning that no Yellowstone will not erupt in the next like five million years or so. Like, who? you're good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. And anybody watching um, who just tuned in, feel free to ask more questions. We've got some great ones already. Um, my first one for you, Crystal, uh, do you have a favorite type of volcano? Oh, a favorite type of volcano. Um, I love the, and it's, it's sad because I actually didn't mention them, but they're called cinder cones because they're so small and they're, they're technically called parasitic volcanoes. What? And basically it's just like little baby offshoots off of like a big volcano. So I like always think of them as like, yeah, like little baby volcanoes, just like coming off of the big mom volcano. And they're just so cute. Um, so cinder cones are definitely have a, a, a place in my heart. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a, that's an excellent favorite. Where, uh, where are those found? Um, you can find it pretty much anywhere. My, the one that I can think of that I can always see, there's one, it's called Fossil Falls. It's off the 395. If you've ever heard of the 395, it's uh, on, in California. Um, but it's, it's basically this little tiny volcano that came off of the Long Valley caldera. So I don't know if you know, but Mammoth Mountain is a giant caldera that was once a super volcano. And these, there's like these little tiny offshoots of these little tiny cinder cones. And if you're driving up the 395 from Southern California, you can actually see that cinder cone. That's just so beautiful. It's like red, it's perfectly sloped. It's right off to your right hand side. So. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to I'm going to take a little road trip. Um, yeah, sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, another question um, about the uh, ring of fire. Does the high concentration of volcanoes in that area impact the ocean temperature in any significant way? And how does it impact animals or plants or other organisms around there? Um, well, there is hydrothermic vents, right? So there's going to be hydrothermic vents all around um, the, the the ring of fire where you're going to have this seafloor spreading and um, there's just all kinds of different stuff going on. But the volcanoes are mostly on land. So they're not really affecting, like if you, if I went, would go back to that image of of where those plates are subducting. Those plates are subducting under land. So they're gonna be mostly on land. There is some on water, obviously, because you have the illusion islands that are going there. So I'm not really sure what the impact was, but honestly, I feel like animals have been living around volcanoes forever. <laughs> That's not, they figured it out. I don't, you know, they, they, they kind of adapt to, to living near volcanoes. Yeah, totally. And another ring of fire question that's come in, um, specific to when you were mentioning the shield volcanoes and, and Hawaii as an example, um, Mauna Loa, if Hawaii sits on the Pacific plate, why is it not technically part of the ring of fire? Ah, and in that photo, actually, they did show that it was, uh, the, it was part of it, I guess, but I don't really consider it part of it. And that's because it's not really on an active plate boundary. So Mauna Loa and Hawaii is part of a hotspot. There, it doesn't, that hotspot is stagnant. So it's kind of like, um, if you're thinking about Yellowstone, right, we can actually trace Yellowstone back to when it was in a different part. It used to be in California, you know, millions and millions of years ago. And what happened is that those plates have been moving. So the ring of fire is mostly just, um, 
stationed around plate boundaries. And if you look at Hawaii, it's like right, right in the middle of the play. <laughs> so, and then Hawaii, and obviously like the Hawaiian islands, all the Hawaiian islands were created by the same mantle plume. And what's happening is that the plate is going over it. And that's why you have all these like string of islands over this mantle plume. But it's actually like um, chemically, it's the exact same type of magma because it's coming from the exact same thing. So it's, they're all the Hawaiian islands uh, are technically clones of, of each other. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird way to look about it, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we have another question that's come in. What do you know about the volcanic Siberian traps that caused the Permian extinction? And what is a trap? I don't know what a trap is. So what is a trap? Dun, dun. <laughs> this, is a, this is a great question, actually. Um, and I should know a lot about this. So the Siberian traps, um, there is like this huge, so traps, I actually don't know the definition of a trap, but it was basically just like this huge volcanic activity that happened. Um, it happened around the PT boundary. I don't know if they've definitively, and by they, I mean, scientists that study that exact same, that, that boundary um, have determined if that was the exact cause of, of the PT boundary mass extinction. So the PT boundary mass extinction, 97% uh, of, of life on earth was wiped off. Everything was dead and everything died and yada, yada, yada. Um, and I actually did do a study on the recovery after um, the mass extinction, the PT mass extinction. Um, and I really don't know. I was looking at maybe like some ocean acidity would have, I mean, if you think about it, if you have a lot of volcanism, it's going to put a lot of ash into the air. It's going to cover the sun. Plants are going to die. It's going to create pretty much uh, acid rain. So you're going to, your oceans are going to get really acidic. I, I don't know again, if that's the exact cause of the PT boundary uh, mass extinction, but it had a definite effect on on what would have happened because you would have just gotten acid ocean and acid rain pretty much everywhere and and no sun so everything would die <laughs> that's gnarly <laughs> but <laughs> that's life that's life on earth right like but that had to happen in order for us to be here so thank you to all of our prehistoric ancestors that had to go in the pre in the PT boundary for us to survive. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And speaking of prehistoric ancestors, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey in geology and um, what you love to study? <laughs> we just heard about this a little bit before. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's tricky. That's tricky. Um, so my, my, uh, my big thing is actually going out and, into the Mojave Desert, and I worked out in the Mojave Desert a lot, and I was looking at, at trilobites out there, and, and I also did uh, Fossil Falls, where there was that cinder cone and that we were talking about, so I can write a whole thing for you if you if you need a field guide, if you ever want to go down south, I, get, I got you, um, but uh, my geology background is much more in paleontology, and I uh, I really study more neogene shark assemblages. I did it for my undergrad and my master's, and I still dabble about it. And, and hopefully there should be some stuff soon, but I didn't say anything. <laughs> um, I did find some some sharks material here at uh, the academy, and and it's it's really interesting and really fun stuff. So um, sharks, sharks, I, I, I love sharks and I love how, how diverse they are and how they've changed through time and how much more of an understanding we have of them. We only had shark teeth for so long and now, um, we're really realizing how diverse they are and, and, and that they have different types of teeth in their mouth. So things that we thought were different are actually the same thing. So how do you correlate all that? So it's fun. Yeah, that's amazing. And one final question for you. Um, can you like tell us a little bit more about your, like what inspired you to get into paleontology and geology? Like what, what really sparked that for you? Oh man, I wish, darn it. I wish I had the picture. I have it on my office. Um, 
but uh, this is going to be really cheesy and I can't believe I'm saying this and, and this is being recorded. So, uh, but really what happened was I took a geology course and it was an AP geology course in high school and they took us out to the Mojave Desert. It was the first time I ever went camping. It was the first time I ever went hiking. I never knew any of this stuff because I'm Hispanic and we don't really go out side <laughs> that way <laughs> so it was like it was it was my first time and we were out in the mojave desert and and we're looking for trilobites and my teacher's like oh yeah well if you're looking for trilobites this is what's going to be and at the time i was in like this really like road trip i was like do i want to go in geology or do i want to go in in biology row um my brother's a veterinary technician so i was like do i want to follow him do i want to go on my own route and so I went out there, I was looking for fossils. <laughs> I didn't find any, I was very bummed out. Everybody was finding stuff. And so I finally went up to my professor and I was like, oh, I can't find anything. All I can find is these squiggly lines. <laughs> and embarrassingly enough, he was like, that's a fossil. You're holding a trilobite. And I was like, oh, I don't know if this means I should be a paleontologist or if I should be a paleontologist. <laughs> So here we are. Maybe the answer was yes. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. I mean, I was like, I, I guess I found them. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. That's such a great story. Um, thanks so yeah. much for sharing with us, uh, both about about your story as well as about volcanoes and um, all of the things. So, yeah, really appreciated you having you on tonight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And if anybody needs to get me, you guys know my, my stuff. I'm at the Academy. You'll find me. <laughs> Heck yeah. Great. Well, All right. Then we're going to go ahead and bring up Ryan to talk about space. Okay. All right. Have fun. Good evening, my name is Ryan White. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. And it's my job to take you now away from Earth and out into space to think about what temperature and heat means in the universe at large. Now, as a starting point, maybe it does make sense to go ahead and start at Earth before we head out to other places. And to do that, I'm going to be using open space software. This is software that's being developed in collaboration with NASA. And I wanna thank Dan Tell, Manager of Planetarium Programs for being my pilot this evening. So I can focus on just talking to you and I don't have to fly and talk at the same time, which is always a little dangerous. So we'll start at Earth. And what's great about our planet is that immediately you have the context that you've already heard about with volcanism and with the activity that keeps our, Earth, our planet warm. But I want to start with the obvious thing. And that's looking at Earth. And right now we're sort of seeing the daytime side of Earth. And when we think about temperature in terms of the way we experience it on our planet, we're really often thinking about what's happening on the surface of the planet. And luckily, Earth has an atmosphere, so we keep our planet overall a little bit warmer than it would be without an atmosphere, because our planet would plunge to sub-freezing temperatures if it weren't for the blanket of atmosphere that we have around Earth. That also means that although things warm up during the day and cool off at night, and we can kind of see the nighttime side of Earth coming into view here, they don't cool off completely. We don't plunge to super low temperatures on the nighttime side of Earth because that blanket of atmosphere sort of keeps it from getting too extreme. So we have pleasant temperatures, although obviously increasing temperatures uh, on Earth as uh, because of our atmosphere. And the question as we think about heat in terms of our, our the experience of our planet is that we need this medium of the atmosphere in terms of the temperature that we're experiencing here on Earth the medium of the atmosphere is how we experience heat and temperature on Earth. And of course, as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, we're getting better better at trapping heat. And the source of that heat energy kind of just moved off screen, and that's the sun. Now, if you think about heat as requiring a medium to communicate, 
So the heat they would experience inside Earth's atmosphere, and you might wonder like what's going on with the sun. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but basically energy from the sun is coming to us in the form of electromagnetic radiation that heats up our atmosphere, which keeps our planet at kind of this relatively temp uh, stable temperature. Now, if we look at the daytime side of the planet again, one of the things that also is pretty obvious is that the parts of the planet closer to the poles are actually a little bit cooler than the parts closer to the equator. We kind of take this as a given, but this is in part because of the angle of incidence of that solar radiation. So when we look at someplace like Antarctica, you'll notice that it's right along the, uh, um, uh, the, the border between day and night over there. And basically, if you think about the angle of sunlight in Antarctica, it's very, very shallow. And so if you think about the sunlight coming from the sun, it's striking Earth at a much more shallow angle. And so we're getting less what astronomers would call insulation on this part of the planet, which is why it remains cool. The same thing is true of the Arctic. Uh, whereas in contrast at the equator, what we would see is more essentially direct sunlight. The sunlight is coming in at closer to sort of a 90 degree angle. So the uh, intensity of the sunlight is greater at the equator. And that's why we have this temperature difference between the poles uh, and, and the equator uh, when we look at Earth's surface. Then that of course has seasonal changes as well. Uh, and the tilt of Earth's axis means that we have variation in these sort of mid latitudes where San Francisco is. And that is sort of how we tend to talk about the surface temperature of Earth. And of course, for astronomers, that's the part of the planet that we see. That's the part of the planet we can study. So even when we talk about exoplanets, planets around other stars, we're typically talking about what we can see in the surface and the atmosphere of the planet. But you've been hearing a lot about what's going on under the surface. And just briefly, the way astronomers think about this is we talk about the uh, two sources, two primary sources of the, of the heat from the planet itself. So in addition to this radiation from the sun that sort of heats the outer part of our planet, the atmosphere, the exterior, the interior has two main drivers of keeping the planet warm. First, there's the residual heat of formation. And then secondly, there's uh, there's the, the decay of radioactive isotopes in our, inside our planet. So to talk about the first one first, the heat of formation. We have a great video that comes from our show, Incoming, which tells the story of asteroids, comets, and as we like to call it, the hard hitting stories of our cosmic origins. This shows what our solar system looked like billions of years ago. And so what we're seeing is a disk of material. Earth would be way inside in kind of that brighter ring that surrounds the central star, the sun. This disk includes lots of stuff inside it. We're gonna zoom in on a small portion. And here we're actually seeing a computer simulation of how planets formed. This is the formation of planetesimals, little objects that became either asteroids or the cores of planets. And as these things collide, they actually sort of heat up a bit. Now, of course, they're also heated by the sun, but this process of colliding together, sticking together, actually heats up the material inside. And if you think about it, if you've had the experience of having like a, a stress ball when you squeeze it a lot, that can sense the temperature increase, you're essentially converting the kinetic energy of your movement into the heat temperature of the, uh, of the object. And that's the same thing that happened in our solar system. Earth is large enough that it's held on to some of that heat of formation. And that means that very importantly, we have a sort of solid inner core and a liquid outer core, but an even more important aspect uh, in terms of our current sort of the warmth of the planet and what drives the energy in the planet is the formation of elements in the universe, such as thorium and uranium. These are radioactive isotopes and the presence of thorium and uranium in Earth's core means that the decay of those atoms as they um, uh, as they experience their half-life of something like billions of years, the decay of those atoms actually heats the interior of the core. That's very good for us. Not only does it drive these processes like volcanism uh, and hydrothermal vents that we've talked about tonight, but it also means that we have plate tectonics. It means that we have a magnetic field, things that are very important for the survival of life on Earth. So that's kind of the context of heat when we talk about Earth 
And for comparison, let's go ahead and travel a little bit closer in toward the sun. I mentioned that the sun is the source of all of this light and heat in our solar system. So let's go ahead and travel to the next planet in from the sun, which is Venus. Now, Venus is often called Earth's twin. It's Earth's twin only in terms of size. It's a very, very different world. And as we approach Venus, you'll see that it's completely covered in clouds. That cloud cover, very different from the sort of spotty clouds of Earth. Instead of seeing the oceans and ice caps that we saw on Earth, we just sort of see this uniform sort of cloudy cover. This is a blanket, a very thick blanket of atmosphere that covers Venus and actually drives temperatures on the surface to around uh, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So part of that is because Venus is closer to the sun, but that greenhouse effect that I mentioned briefly, but I don't think it referred to as greenhouse effect when we were at Earth, that effect of the atmosphere keeping the planet warm is kind of, kind of an overdrive at Venus. And this was sort of a first warning sign that uh, astronomers and people who looked at planetary atmospheres saw when they looked at Venus and saw the quantity of carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere they realized that this was helping to drive the kind of superheated surface of the planet. And in fact, the same computational models that were used to understand what's happening on Venus and what's happening at Mars were the computational models that were used to study Earth's atmosphere and the sort of ancestors of the computational models that we use today to think about how climate will change on our planet. So now that we're close into Venus and we can see this, this atmosphere covered world, let's go ahead and uh, zoom in a little closer. And since we've talked about volcanoes already this evening, let's visit a volcano on Venus. To do that, we'll sort of artificially strip away uh, the atmosphere so we can see what the surface looks like underneath. Using different wavelengths of light, we've been able to peer through those thick clouds and this sort of uh, overall kind of crumpled texture that we see here is mostly a radar map of Venus. So looking at what portions of the planet are sort of more rough and and, and less reflective of, uh, and more reflective of, of radar uh, and what areas are smoother. We're coming in at Ma'at Mons, which is a site of volcanism in Venus's past. We know that Venus has probably more volcanoes than any other place in the solar system, but most of them are apparently extinct. We can tell that the surface of the planet has been sort of resurfaced. It's relatively fresh. So we know that these volcanoes have been active in the past, but we don't see much activity today. So Venus is this extraordinarily different world from Earth, very similar in size, a little bit smaller, closer into the sun, but radically different from the way uh, from, from our own home planet Earth, and not a planet that's particularly hospitable to life. And in terms of heat in the solar system, this is the record-breaking record planet. It is the hottest planet in the solar system. If we go ahead and leave San, uh, uh, Venus behind, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the closest planet into the sun, uh, and that's our planet Mercury. Now, Mercury is very close into the sun, um, about uh, a quarter of the distance from um, uh, the Earth, of Earth's distance from the sun. It receives a lot of that heat, light and heat from the sun, but fundamental difference between Earth and Venus and Mercury is that Mercury has no atmosphere, essentially. There are planetary scientists who would love to talk about the very sort of traces of, of, of atmosphere that we see on Mercury, but for comparison, certainly compared to Venus and compared to Earth, this is a world without an atmosphere. It's a little bit like the moon. And in fact, when you look at this, it kind of looks like Earth's moon. I won't spend a lot of time here, but I just wanted to point out that this daytime side of Mercury that we're seeing is getting the full brunt of the radiation from the sun. It's superheated hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, but the nighttime side is freezing cold. And Part of this is because of there's a lack of atmosphere. But also, uh, and so as the uh, as the planet um, is heated by the sun, you're just heating the surface. But also, it has relative to its the period it takes to revolve around the sun to complete one of its Mercurian years, compared to its day, uh, is 
its day is very, very long. So the planet also has lots of time. The nighttime side has lots of time to cool off. So Mercury is this perfect example of how important an atmosphere is to maintain uh, a level of, of heat and livability on the surface of a planet. Uh, but without it, you have this uh, radical difference in temperatures from the daytime side to the nighttime side. Well, we can see the sun kind of off in the distance there, and we see sort of this orangey yellow uh, disc at the center of the artificial glow that we use to represent the intense light and heat of the sun. Uh, but what we can do is we can take a closer look at the sun and think a little bit about this source of light and heat in our solar system. And there's one kind of interesting temperature punchline that I thought I would mention uh, while we're here. So this is a kind of mediated view of the sun. Of course, the sun is insanely bright. Never look at it without uh, protection for your eyes. This is a representation of the solar surface um, at kind of uh, visible-ish wavelengths. And what I actually wanted to focus on, the surface of the sun, we usually talk about it being thousands of degrees. Uh, and actually, it doesn't matter if you want to talk Celsius or Fahrenheit, let's just say thousands of degrees. But the corona of the sun uh, and here we're representing the kind of magnetic fields that actually accelerate particles moving away from the sun's surface. That energy input into these particles that stream away from the sun actually increases the temperature through a mechanism we don't really understand in the sun's corona and its outer atmosphere. So that surface is only, only thousands of degrees, but the corona actually has a very diffuse medium that's millions of degrees. So temperature and heat have kind of different meanings in astronomy and become a little counterintuitive and a little bit, because if you were out in uh, this outer corona of the sun, you wouldn't really feel that huge, that significantly huge temperature because the medium is so diffuse. So uh, the vacuum of space uh, doesn't allow the transmission of heat very efficiently. But let's go ahead and kind of end now with just one punchline here to the way astronomers often talk about temperature and to some degree heat. And that is when we talk about different wavelengths of light. It turns out that we can look at the universe, not just in the narrow band of visible wavelengths that our eyes can perceive. So in the distance here, we can see the Milky Way made up of hundreds of billions of stars with clouds of gas uh, and dust obscuring the view of more distant stars. So you see the intricate dust lanes uh, that are so characteristic of the Milky Way galaxy when we see it out at night. But we can see the Milky Way and the universe around us at many different wavelengths of light. So our eyes perceive things that are relatively hot like stars, but if we look at much longer wavelengths, lower energy wavelengths, we can see cool material. Now this is really cold. The wavelength of light we're looking here is about 100 microns, and that corresponds to a temperature of like four, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, or around minus 240 degrees Celsius. That's not much above absolute zero. This is the cool dust in between the stars. We see this as dark dust lanes, but the very cool interstellar medium is filled with this very small scale uh, dust, these dust particles. Talk a lot about dust in terms of astronomical terms, but let's go to, to a little bit longer wavelengths here. And again, keeping that plane of the Milky Way galaxy in view and look at an image from uh, what's called, I think this is actually two mass. Um, I don't know if we have the IRAS view of the sky. I'd like to talk about that one first. So the um, the two things I mentioned, two mass was a survey that was done from Earth. IRAS, uh, it was the infrared astronomical satellite that was launched in the 80s. You can see that the band of the Milky Way in infrared is very thin, very narrow, and you'll see it's kind of this bluish color. Now what we're doing is we're color coding the different wavelengths of light which roughly correspond to different temperatures. Now, things that are closer to a bluish color are almost like human temperatures, actually. They're not too dissimilar from the temperature that, uh, that of, of you and me. 
So in fact, if you could look at us in infrared light, and there's great websites that NASA has where you can do this, you would see that we glow, we emit infrared radiation because we're the right temperature for to emit that wavelength of light. We're not as cold as that dust we saw earlier. We're not as hot as a star, but we're this temperature that emits sort of mid uh, infrared light as astronomers refer to it. And here you're seeing great bubbles and structures of material that is, again, relative to that super cold dust, dust that's being heated to sort of human temperatures by the action of star formation and other cool things happening inside our galaxy. If we go to the next image, uh, two mass is a survey that was done from Earth, as I mentioned, that sees, now here you can almost see the, the band of the Milky Way disappears. We're kind of looking away from the center of the Milky Way. And what these wavelengths of light allow us to do is here we really are seeing stars, but we're seeing through a lot of that dust uh, that uh, obscures our view at optical wavelengths. Again, there's a whole story of story there. Let's go ahead and transition though as we move closer to looking toward the center of our galaxy, let's transition to optical wavelengths. And again, this is where we're seeing the nice hot stars, the stars that are thousands of degrees. Uh, if you know your constellations, you'll see Cygnus uh, sort of directly in front of us here. In fact, the whole summer triangle, uh, the Deneb is the star over on the left. Toward the top, we have uh, Vega. And toward the lower right, we have Altair. That triangle of stars is easy to spot in the summer sky. And these individual points of light that we see are thousands of degrees, like our own sun. And there are so many of them that they kind of blur into the Milky Way uh, that, uh, that we see crossing the center of the image. And then, as I said, the dust clouds that block the light from those more distant stars, creating sort of shadows in front of that. So this is the kind of hot stuff in the universe, but in fact, there's even more extreme activity in the universe, which is our sort of final image. This is an image from an X-ray satellite. Now, X-rays are much, much shorter, much higher energy wavelength light than we can perceive with our eyes. They're, of course, used to look through our uh, fleshy parts, to look at bones and the interior structure uh, of our animal selves. Uh, but in the universe, X-rays are created by the most energetic phenomena. Now, that is related to some degree to temperature, but I'll just wrap this up with one image that I can't resist showing, uh, which is a short clip from our new planetarium show, Spark. And this shows a supernova remnant, so the remains of a dying star, and that's what the show is all about, how dying stars gave us the elements for habitable planets and life, including uranium and thorium that I mentioned early on. And here we're seeing a replication of an X-ray view of this supernova remnant, which is called Cassiopeia A. And the glowing material you see here, it's certainly very energetic, but it's not exactly temperature. It's not exactly heat. There are other physical processes at work. So when astronomers look at the sky, we often use wavelength as a sort of proxy for temperature and it lets under, us understand the interstellar medium what's heating it up and it also involves processes that are a little more exotic and so we have to understand the finer details of the structure of light in order to understand what's happening in the universe around us but <coughs> excuse me when I first heard of this topic of talking about things that are heated that's the astronomical perspective that came to me, and I hope it uh, gives a little bit of a different viewpoint compared to some of the things that you've heard about earlier in the program. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Ryan, for sharing with us. And thank you so much, Dan, for, for piloting the planetarium from the planetarium. I, it's always such amazing visuals. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. First off, I'm sure when you talk about space, you get questions about like extraterrestrial life all the time. So I'm sorry if this is a little cliche, but can no heat worries. be used as a metric for potential for extraterrestrial life? I well, you hear about the Goldilocks zone. Yeah. So was well, yeah, that's 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 a really good um, that's a really good point. So I mentioned that um, you know Earth has a nice stable environment because and I mentioned our atmosphere, but it's also our, our distance from the sun. So an Earth-sized planet with an atmosphere like ours 
at this distance from the sun. We're actually kind of on the inner edge of the habitable zone. So we're at the close end of that distance from the sun where we have good temperatures for, for life to exist, life as we know it. Um, but uh, that habitable zone extends a little farther away from the sun. And, and that's kind of our assumption for an Earth-like planet where you would need to reside if you wanted to have, be a good place to find life. Um, in terms of the search for life, that means that we often target Earth-like planets in that just around that distance, that corresponding distance from their parent star. But actually, there are ways that we can look for kind of temperature imbalances as well. And one of the things that uh, we're interested in looking for with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence are things that are a little out of whack for a planet. And actually, the emission and temperature of a planet can be an indicator that there's something else going on. And it might not be conclusive evidence on its own, but it's an interesting suggestion uh, that there might be something happening on that planet that is driven by life there. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, when you're talking about wavelengths of light and heat, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about heat and light are related? I know from sure. my personal experience, it seems like not everything that emits heat emits light. Is that true? No, that's a that's a really great point. And it's this um, kind of fascinating way that in physics, we 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 talk about this intersection a lot. But it's 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 the experience of these phenomena can be very different. If you want to experience the most direct connection of feeling light and heat, I mean, certainly when you're out in the sun, you can feel that warmth of the sun. That's basically not really the optical wavelengths, not the visible part of the sun spectrum that's really heating you up. The infrared wavelengths, which as I mentioned, are the sort of temperature that we're emitting at, are actually what we would kind of sense as heat. And what happens is uh, wavelengths that are too short, kind of like x-rays, they sort of pass through us. Wavelengths that are, uh, or bl are blocked by us, we absorb them, um, or, or, or light reflects off of our the, our surface, but but infrared light is the right wavelength for our molecules in our bodies to absorb it, and sort of it's like um, astronomers or physicists would talk about a resonant frequency. Is that a frequency that that kind of uh, transfers that energy of light to the matter most efficiently? So that's kind of the the best way I can think of describing the connection between light and heat, um, especially heat that we would sense or feel. It's because of what we're made out of and how it responds to specific wavelengths of light. Mm, gotcha. Okay, well, I'll work on trying to see more infrared light. I've not gotten there yet, but yeah. I'm making significant progress. Um, when I think historically of astronomy and like kind of learning about outer space, I'm often really fascinated by what people were able to do historically hundreds and even thousands of years ago in terms of understanding space, even with the naked eye, never mind like the super advanced telescopes we have now. Um, when did humans first start understanding how we can study heat specifically in space from our position here on Earth? Is that something we needed this technology for or were people who were really attuned able to kind of make uh, estimations about this prior? Yeah, the, the real beginning of that kind of understanding of um, the nature of, of, sort of what's out there, it, it was, um, I mean, first of all, there's a, there, there's kind of a, an assumption that you have to make that the stuff out there is the same as the stuff here, which started out as an unreasonable assumption for people thousands of years ago, but became more reasonable as we learn more about the universe around us and learn that gravity, which works well here on Earth, seems to work really well in space as well. And then by extension, then we tried to understand whether the other laws of physics that are familiar here work in space. So there's kind of this buildup from I would say sort of the 17th century onward, beginning with gravity and our understanding of gravity, and then extending to particularly electromagnetic radiation, of which visible light is, is one form and infrared light and that kind of idea of heat is connected to. And uh, William Herschel was the first person we know of who realized that um, he was taking visible light and splitting it up into its constituent colors. So if you think of a, of a, of a rainbow or a spectrum, uh, going from from like violet light uh, through blue, green, yellow, orange, red, kind of traditional uh, breakup of the colors. That um, that spectrum we now know represents wavelengths of light that go from 
short to long. And what Herschel noticed is that when he tried to measure the temperature with his thermometer, when he moved the thermometer past the red end of the spectrum, infrared, longer than red wavelengths, he saw an increase in temperature. And that's because, again, those wavelengths of light are driving up the temperature of material uh, in the thermometer. So that was the first like real direct connection between temperature and heat and uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and, and astronomy. And then that got extended in the early 20th century as we began to understand more about the physics of stars. And that's a huge story in terms of understanding the heat and formation and structure of, of, of stars. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna close out the show. Great, thanks very much. Great to be here. Hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you so much, Crystal and Ryan, for sharing with us tonight. It has been an absolute delight. And despite the scalding nature of these topics, I am thankfully less sweaty than I thought I would be. Um, pretty cool. <laughs> It's amazing to not be super sweaty. Yeah. We are live the third Thursday of every month, which means that we will be back for one more time in 2023, this calendar year on December 21st. And um, this one is for everyone who told us in the forum that they love the ocean, because this episode is going to be all about the life that thrives in the expansive, breathtaking, some may say scary ecosystem that is the pelagic zone, AKA the open ocean. Mm-hmm. Hello, Thalassophobia. Until we return to explore the open ocean, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, the California Academy of Sciences, so you'll know when we're live. You can find every other Night School episode ever aired over there, quite literally hours of incredible perspectives from scientists, artists, and more for free anytime, anywhere. And if you'd like, once again, here is the QR code and a link that is in the chat currently that leads to the survey that will help us to continue making night school with all of you in mind, uh, regulars and newcomers alike. We'd love it if you took a second to fill it out. Uh, for those of you who have already filled it out and suggested ideas for upcoming episodes, like we listen, it's the next one. It's about the open ocean. So if you have something you'd like to see, please let us know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great rest of the night. We'll see you next month. See ya. Bye. Bye.